Welcome everyone to this um, workshop on media engagement, making education for reconciliation news. I'd like to welcome Cheryl McNamara, who is our media relations coordinator on staff here at Kairos. Cheryl comes to us with a wealth of activism and media experience. And so we are very glad to have her on staff with us and to have her expertise here today to share with us for the sake of our Kairos Winds of Change campaign and the work that we are doing in terms of education for reconciliation. Welcome Cheryl and thank you for being with us. Thank you Shannon and welcome everybody. Um, I know that when we did our letters to the editor webinar a month ago there were some sound issues so please uh, uh, let us know if you're having trouble hearing. Uh, we definitely want to rectify that. So yes, yeah, so uh, last month we, we looked at uh, writing letters to the editor and uh, for this uh, we're going to be working on a f looking at a few uh, things, including um, fostering relationships with uh, editors and columnists, as well as meeting with the editorial board or the editor and writing op-eds. And just a, a reminder uh, for those who were here last month, but also certainly for you, those of you who are, are new, um, the real big objective of engaging with the media is to build political will in support of the campaigns that we are working on. So for Kairos, of course, right now it's the winds of change. Uh, we want um, our governments uh, and everybody really to adopt the 94 calls uh, laid out by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Uh, we're starting right now with uh, Education for Reconciliation, uh, call number 62.1. Um, I will be focused on this campaign um, during this webinar. However, um, what I have to offer is broad enough that for those of you who are working on other campaigns, um, this should be a value as well. So first, just a bit of, about my background. Um, I, as, as Shannon mentioned, I am an activist uh, focused on climate. That's kind of been my focus. I, uh, I've been volunteering with the Citizens Climate Lobby for five years. Uh, I founded the Toronto chapter and uh, the Citizens Climate Lobby, in addition to meeting with our uh, elected representatives, we also engage with the media because it helps to build political will uh, for what we want our governments to do. And uh, I've met with the uh, editorial board of the Toronto Star three times, with the Global Mail once, and my op-eds have appeared in numerous papers across the country. A few using my byline, uh, but a lot of them I've ghost written uh, largely for Jennifer Henry. Uh, okay, so uh, in terms of fostering relationships with our editors and columnists, um, uh, this is important because most daily newspapers and to an extent smaller papers as well, have an editorial section. And this is really the voice of the paper. And you'll know when you go into the editorial um, part of the paper, usually on the left side, there's going to be a, um, an article. It's an opinion piece. It doesn't have a byline to it. Um, it's written by the comments editor or somebody in the editorial team. Uh, and it is considered the voice of the paper. Uh, some... Uh, Major newspapers actually have editorial boards. That includes the Global Mail, the National Post, the Toronto Star. I know the Ottawa Citizen has one. Uh, it has just a few people. Um, some papers have this. It depends on how big they are. Some papers just have a comments editor, and that's it. Um, so this is a good thing to find out when you actually start to engage with the comment or opinion, <clears throat> excuse me, editor. Um, so some small papers may not even have an editor, editorial section, uh, but if they do, it's likely going to be written by the editor. Um, so the objective of all of this, of, you know, why do we want to engage uh, with the editorial boards or the comment or opinion editors and even columnists as well, uh, is that we want to build a very trusting relationship with them so that they can write editorials or columns in support of our campaigns. 
uh, particularly when it comes to the voice of the paper. That is a real shot in the arm. Um, one thing to keep in mind as well in this day and age, unfortunately, newspapers in Canada and around the world are suffering. Uh, they're competing against the digital age and they're competing for ad dollars. And what we are seeing is a climb back of um, <clears throat> staff, um, which is really, really unfortunate, but that's unfortunate. That's just our current reality. And in particular, I don't know if you've been following the news on the news, but um, post media in particular um, might be going under. Um, and post media owns a number of really important papers in Canada, including uh, the Vancouver Sun, Calgary Herald, the Ottawa Citizen, the Montreal Gazette, to name a few. Yes, they also own Sun, uh, the Sun newspaper chain. Um, I'm not going to get into the, the gory details of it, but um, it's post media is likely going to go under, and um, hopefully these important papers will be bought up locally. Um, but we're not too sure what's going to happen. Uh, so the long and short of it is that newsrooms are actually stretched pretty thin, and some of you probably know this already. Um, if you're sending in an article, even an article on an event, like a, or rather, sorry, a, a media advisory on an event, um, often what I'll do when I send one out, I will call the newsroom and say, can you uh, follow this? And often when I, when I speak to somebody in the newsroom of a newspaper, they'll say, we're really stretched thin, we can't guarantee anything right now. So while this is a problem, it's also a bit of an opportunity uh, in that uh, it is an opportunity to develop a rather trusting relationship with um, an editor. And one way to do that is to send them um, position papers or otherwise known as editorial packets. These are about four to five page, uh, things like three to five page um documents that uh, provide in editorial style the campaign that you're working on uh, and it provides links to really important resources really well-founded resources ideally you know well sourced maybe from you know well-researched um, sources that a newspaper would treat seriously um, and for uh, the education for reconciliation campaign we're just polishing up uh, the media packets or the uh, position papers for education for reconciliation for each province um, and those will be available very shortly um, so stay tuned so oh sorry I probably shouted I'm so sorry for those of you uh, who heard that um, how to woo an editor or writer so really it is, and in, in, in a way it is, we are, um, you know, flirting and wooing uh, them. Uh, we want to develop a relationship. So the first step is always to read the editorials or the columns of, you know, the paper or the person that you're interested in. And, and when I say person, uh, a columnist, somebody who writes on an issue um, that, uh, that you're concerned about or that you're working on. And an example, for those of you who are familiar with the Toronto Star, Carol Gore. Carol Gore is a columnist. She also is on the editorial board of the Toronto Star. And she typically writes articles on Aboriginal issues. Um, so she's a good one uh, to keep in mind um, when you're sending information. Uh, so definitely read, um, read their editorials and columns. And then you want to start flirting with them. So you want to send a heartfelt thank you to the editor regarding, you know, a recent editorial that, that you really liked. And I mean, clearly it should be something um, that you're, you know, an issue that you're working on. Uh, and even if it's that they say things that, you know, you may not agree with, still write to them, thank them for it. And, um, you know, you might, you might not know, but, you know, provide them with, with some information um, that they didn't cover or offer another side. Uh, but mostly just thank them. Uh, it's a good way to start uh, the relationship. And I'm, I will go into a case study with my first meeting or first engagement with the Toronto Star um, to kind of uh, give you an example of how that really worked. Um, so you also, and as, as I mentioned, you might want to send a link or two of some helpful resources related to the issue. Next step, you want to ask for a date. And uh, that means you want to, if it's with the editorial board, um, you want to meet with them. Typically with a columnist, uh, you don't 
really do that. Uh, but with an editorial board, um, yeah, they, they definitely take meetings um, with folks out in the community. So what's coming out for education for reconciliation, of course, is um, you know, we're going to start to be meeting with our elected representatives in the spring. It would be fantastic if folks can get meetings with the editorial boards of their local press uh, to present the issue to them. Um, and in particular, uh, you know, the broad issue of reconciliation, uh, bringing some experts or offer to bring in some ex experts. Um and see what they say. So make that pitch. Uh, you want to send an email, and then you want to follow up with a phone call to see if they're interested. And I'll, I'll speak a little bit more specifically about that in a minute. Um, then you want to, uh, if they say yes, and even if they say no, but if they say yes, you send them a present, and that is your um, position paper or media packet, um, which you will have um, for Education for Reconciliation. Um, and then... When you get the meeting and, uh, you know, afterwards, you want to pop the big question, which is, would you consider writing uh, an editorial in support of this? Uh, if they say no, then ask them if they would consider printing an op-ed from you. So it's important to have an op-ed at the ready. Um, and even if they decline the meeting, definitely follow up with the, the position paper. So those are kind of the, the steps you want to take. Um, now, some of you would rather have a root canal than engage with uh, your local press, particularly when it comes to the editor of the editorial board of the blah, 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 right? Um, and you might be thinking, you know, well, it might be easy for Cheryl McNamara to, you know, pick up the call, make a pitch and, and find out if they want to meet. Um, but I can tell you, when I first started doing this, it was not easy. <laughs> I was very scared. And um, I want to get into a case study, um, my first meeting with the, the Toronto Star. Um, it was basically a year in the making in terms of our first engagement with them to getting an editorial in somewhat in support of what we wanted. And for the citizens, when I say we, I mean Citizens Climate Lobby. And what we were looking for was a very specific um, carbon pricing policy um, that, they wanted, that we wanted them to support. So uh, back in the summer of 2011, um, we, uh, we knew we just started our chapter and we knew that we needed to engage with our local press. And, uh, one of our volunteers named John stood, stepped up and he, he took the initiative, uh, to start this relationship. Uh, I was focused on the global mail. So, uh, John, uh, basically emails Andrew Phillips, who is the editor of the editorial board of the Toronto star and, um, asked him for, for a meeting. Um, and Andrew said, listen, it's the summertime or the staff is pretty tight right now. Uh, we, we, we really don't have enough staff uh, for a meeting. We had asked to meet about, um, our carbon pricing uh, mechanism, but he said, listen, we don't know you send some information about, about you. We'll read it. Um, and, and we might be, you know, available in the fall. So that was great. That was the first good engagement. Um, the autumn came, and at that point, we uh, were helping the uh, Climate Action Network with uh, their campaign to eliminate fossil fuel subsidies. I think this is something that uh, um, a lot of us um, are very sympathetic to. And um, we thought, oh, this would be a great uh, opportunity. We're engaged in the campaign. We can meet them about this. We can also talk about carbon pricing. So we, uh, John followed up, said, can you meet about this? And he said, it's, John, um, Andrew said, it's, it's a little narrow focus for us. Um, send us a position paper. We'll read it. But yeah, we're not going to meet about this. We had advice from um, uh, the communications director at CCL in the United States. He said, no, you should really, you should press them on this. And so we did. And Andrew shot back. He was very crusty, very terse with us. He said, I don't need to meet with you on this particular issue. Just send us the position paper. And I thought, oh, heavens, we blew this relationship. He's angry at us. So I said, John, please just give him what he wants. So we send our, uh, sent him his, the position paper. At that point in time, um, John had to step back. He had to go uh, get ready because he was moving to Paris for a job. So I took over and I started to flirt. 
in that I started to follow what uh, uh, the Toronto Star was printing in terms of their editorials. I was emailing Andrew saying, I really like what you had to say with, with this. And, and it was genuine. Uh, I really like their editorials. And Andrew would, would email me back and say, thank you. Thank you very much, which surprised me because I thought that, you know, they would, didn't really care about our opinions, but really they do. And um, I do remember uh, contacting or emailing a columnist from the Edmonton Journal many years ago um, who wrote uh, about he wrote an article that really uh, questioned the tar sands and he was writing about climate change. And I wrote him thanking him for, for his article. And he came back to me and he said, well, thank you. You're probably the only one who thanked me <laughs> because he was getting a lot of hate email. And I can imagine, um, you know, editors uh, and columnists would probably receive a lot of email and a lot of it's probably negative. So sending a really positive, affirming thank you really does go a long way. So um, March comes along, March of 2012, and Mark Reynolds, the executive director of Citizens Climate Lobby, was going to be in town, as well as the new uh, ed, um, uh, ED of the Climate Action Network. Mark suggested that I follow up with the Toronto Star and ask for another meeting. Well, I didn't know. I, you know, we tried once with a meeting, and... Um, and that didn't go so well. So, but I thought that, yeah, you know, it doesn't hurt to try. So I put together my pitch. I emailed it to Andrew and uh, didn't hear back from him. The following day, I thought, you're going to have to call him. And I dreaded it. You know, a day goes by and you're dreading something that you have to do. I really dreaded this. Um, I knew I needed to call him at five o'clock. Five o'clock is a good time to call uh, editors and journalists uh, simply because it's after their deadlines have passed and uh i called in trepidation at five o'clock and andrew picked up he said uh, i said you know very nervously you know i was just following up on on the email and it, if this would be of interest to him and his response was oh oh i did respond to you Oh, well, let me see. And I had given him two date, two uh, times and dates. And he said, well, Thursday at 11 o'clock, does that work? And I said, yes. Um, it was as if we were arranging to have coffee. Uh, it was that simple. So, um, uh, and then he asked, please send me your position paper so we can read it uh, in preparation for the meeting, uh, which I did. So I was absolutely elated. Um, uh, we did a pre-meeting, we being Mark, uh, Christian, and myself, uh, just to make sure that our, our ducks were in a roll and we wanted to ensure that, you know, our key messages came across. Um, in the meeting itself, they gave us an hour. There were four people in the uh, from the editorial uh, board. Uh, there's more people that uh, belong to the board, but four people could join us. Uh, they gave us an hour, and Andrew, the editor, was the one who really kind of peppered us with questions. Like he really took charge, and I found that was certainly the case with the Globe and Mail as well. So that when you are meeting, just know that the editor is going to be taking charge and he's going to, he or she is going to be asking you some questions. Uh, they really are leading the meeting. Uh, I was able to meet with uh, the person who actually does um, the editorials on climate change, Gordon, per uh, sorry, uh, Gord Barthos, very nice man. Um, and he assured me, we read everything you send us, which was gratifying. Um, the thing that came up in the meeting was, uh, they felt that, uh, carbon taxes wouldn't work in Canada. Uh, there was an attempt with, uh, Stefan Dion in 2008, uh, and we explained that there was actually a very good example in British Columbia with the BC uh, carbon tax, not a perfect tax, but at least it showed that emissions, uh, were reducing, um, and it didn't hurt the economy. So that was news to them. Uh, so that was great. Um, so that was kind of the big thing that came out of the meeting. We were able to educate them. Um, I continued to send information, and in August uh, that year, uh, they wrote an editorial in support of a carbon tax. We were absolutely thrilled. So, and it took a year. That took a year in the making, just as an FYI. Um, <laughs> 
The one thing before I move on that I also want to add is um, I've had some really great chats with Andrew Phillips, the editor. Um, I pitched him on a number of occasions and he shot me down twice uh, on what I was proposing, um, one of which really surprised me when we wanted to bring in somebody from the insurance industry and he was very skeptical. So um, we had a really good talk about um, kind of what they're looking for. So I really allowed him to educate me. Um, I always listened respectfully to, to what he had to say. Um, but we were also able to get uh, two more meetings in, one focused on clean tech and another one on carbon pricing. We were able to bring another visiting expert in. So it's been a really great relationship. Um, Gord Barthos from time to time contacts me with a question. Um, so great start. Uh, or it was certainly, a, a, you know, a, a, we didn't give up. And that's, I think, the, the lesson learned here. Uh, so, lessons learned. Um, when you go in to pitch a meeting, um, offer to cover more of a broad issue like reconciliation, uh, certainly from a local perspective. Uh, and if you could bring in local experts and spokespeople, I would definitely, with a case for education for reconciliation, please bring in uh, an Indigenous um, spokesperson. Um, to get that side of the story as well. And then ensure that within that conversation, you bring up, you know, where, you know, making sure that all 94 calls to action need to be done, need to be realized. Uh, we're starting with call to action 62.1 for this specific reason. Um, so, uh, and then you want to relate to obviously to what the province is up to, and that's going to be covered or, or certainly covered in um, the position paper that you'll have access to. Um, you always want to do a follow up call. So, usually you do a pitch, you, you send an email to them, and then maybe the next day at around five o'clock, uh, give them a call. And uh, if the editor declines, you know, you might want to politely ask why. And in some cases, like the Ottawa Citizen, um, they said that we did tend not to meet with people. So, uh, or uh, there might be a very specific reason why. And it will help you refine your pitch, another pitch in the future. Um, never be argumentative with them. Uh, remember, this is a, a relationship that you want to foster. Um, okay. So now, uh, and I will be taking questions afterwards. Uh, so now I just want to get into op-ed writing. Uh, op-eds, as I mentioned, are really good to have in your back pocket. Uh, if, um, if they don't want to print an editorial or they don't want to run an editorial on it, then perhaps they can print your op-ed. And, and I do want to caution, uh, having, offering an op-ed is not a guarantee that they are going to print it. Um, typically, I certainly know with the Globe and Mail, they get about 30 um, submissions every day. So uh, that's something uh, to keep in mind. So up at tips, and, and just so you know, I will have, be having, or uh, we will include after um, a document that really outlines these tips so that you can have them. Um, so really the most, to, to think about or to keep in mind when you are offering up or writing an op-ed and submitting one is that it really needs to be topical. Now, with the case of uh, education for, for reconciliation, it is. We're, we're getting a lot of uh, news uh, of late, thanks to the TRC, but certainly with the case of missing and murdered Indigenous women uh, and the inquiry, um, this is definitely in the news um so uh it's not a bit of an issue but if you're dealing with issues like israel palestine for example um if it's not in the news um the the papers will be hard pressed to to print it um you you usually want to ask what the local angle is um you know certainly with an issue like climate change um, people tend not to care about polar bears, but um, they are concerned about what's happening to their local climate. So uh, you always want to kind of tie make that local connection. And uh, certainly with uh, education for reconciliation, um, a, the local angle, of course, is the provincial one and what the province is up to. Um, of course, you want to be compelling right from the start. Always remember that. Um, you really do need to grab the reader's attention. Um, 
And uh, one way to do that, and, and just to address the point about getting personal, um, in op-eds, sometimes you want to get personal, sometimes it's not really appropriate, but in the case for education for reconciliate, reconciliation, it kind of is. Um, and one way to start your op-ed is to, to talk about, write about your own experience going to school. You know, did you learn about the, the residential schools? Did you learn about the treaties? Did you learn about um, the positive contributions historically and currently um, of indig Indigenous peoples in our country? And um, I bet you, a lot of you, like me, the answer is no. So you want to start with that. Um, so that's, that's you know, certainly uh, uh, one big tip specific to uh, writing an op-ed on this issue. Um, you always want to write, focus on kind of an, a narrative approach. Um, some people think that, you know, you need to put lots of facts in there, but sometimes that can be a bit daunting for people. If you have important facts, just choose one or two really important ones. But you're, you're weaving a story, right, um, uh, in a sense. And narratives like storytelling are far more compelling. Uh, always you want to be focused, um, you know, typically like with any issue, you want to, there's so many different points that you want to make. Um, so you have to choose, uh, you need to choose either the salient point or the most important point, you know, that you want to get across with your campaign, for example. Uh, and if you say, if you put in too many points, really you end up saying nothing. Um, uh, I always like to create an outline. Uh, I'm sure some of you, when you write, like to do that as well. Uh, that is very helpful. And along that line, um, one thing to keep in mind when you're writing is to answer the questions. And that means don't assume that the reader knows uh, anything, really, about um, the issue that you're writing about. So assume that they know nothing about the TRC. They know nothing about the calls to action. They know nothing, certainly, about the residential schools, the, the treaties, and everything like that. Um, so that when you write something like the TRC, well, what is that? You need to you know, write it out, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Um, excuse me. Uh, and then what is it? Um, you know, a brief kind of paragraph on what it was, or certainly is. And um, so I think, you know, always, always approach it from the point of view of the reader, assuming that the reader knows nothing about this. Uh, and that can help with your outline as well, you know. Uh, in terms of some other uh, tips just to kind of close, uh, you know, certainly uh, tools of the writer's craft, like like metaphor, simile, uh, that sort of thing, are helpful. Uh, an example is uh, I remember reading a, a really good op-ed on uh, climate change from a climate scientist, and he started with the whole metaphor of high stakes poker. Um, you know, he enjoys a good game of poker with his friends, but he does not like high stakes poker, and he was able to extend that metaphor uh, on the climate. Uh, so that's kind of a an example. Um, so in terms of your ending, uh, you always want to end well, um, and it's important to ensure that kind of you repeat the main point uh, of the op-ed, and that usually can take care of itself when you cycle back to, um, you know, your opening. An example, you're writing an op-ed about education for reconciliation, you open about your own personal story going to school, you never learn this. Say you have children or grandchildren. Um, perhaps you want to mention, you know, I don't want my own children uh, growing up ignorant of this. Um, again, you know, uh, emphasizing uh, the the urgency of this, really. Uh, so that gives you kind of a, a, an idea of, of how you may want to structure this particular op-ed. And then uh, finally, you know, the big question is, can you write a headline? Um, you know, if you cannot sum up... Uh, um, the op-ed in, in a couple of words, then, then you might want to rewrite. You might want to, you know, uh, look again at, at, at the focus. So, so those are the tips on writing op-eds. And again, as I said, I will uh, you will have available to you a document that kind of fleshes out these points. Uh, in terms of submitting your op-ed, um, make sure, of course, that you're observing the word limit. Um, 
Some papers like the Globe and Mail are 650 words. Um, some are longer, 750. So it's uh, definitely you want to uh, absorb that. Otherwise, they likely won't print it. Um, always ask for editing help. If you know somebody who's a good writer, uh, ask if they can have a look at it and provide um, edits. Um, if you're submitting on behalf of Kairos um, Canada, then uh, definitely send it to myself and Ed Bianchi. Um, we will not only provide you with editorial support, but uh, Ed does need to have final approval on it. Um, always include uh, the suggested headline. Keep in mind that uh, papers, if they do accept your op-ed, they're going to change the headline, so good to know. Uh, the names of the authors, if it's more than one, obviously, and uh, the short bios uh, and headshots as well. And I always like to include the word count of the piece. Uh, do pa paste your op-ed into the body of the email. Some editors prefer that, and then you might want to also include the attachment. Um, and then uh, do call the editor the following day to see if they received it and will consider it. Um, and that's a good way. I always, I know it, it can seem a bit daunting to call um, an, an editor, um, but it's a really good way to foster a relationship um, with them. And uh, sometimes, you know, I've, I've even called them before I submit an op-ed and say, listen, I'm thinking of doing this. Would this be of interest? And they'll tell you, well, we can't guarantee. Fair enough. Um, but then you might want to say, well, I'm thinking of positioning like this. What do you think? And I did that once, actually, uh, for the Toronto Star. And um, I got his advice. And then I wrote the op-ed. And then I wrote him in my email um, I said, you know, I really took your advice to heart. Thank you so much. It meant a lot. Um, and I, I don't know, I think it may have, you know, helped him, you know, think of, he, he didn't print it, but he, he posted it online. So that was, that was nice. Um, a little bit of a, a tip there for you. Oh, uh, and oh, also very, very important. Don't call if they tell you not to call. Um, really observe that. Uh, again, you don't really, you don't want to uh, tick them off. So um, observe any instruction that uh, that they offer. Uh, the Global Mail, by the way, they don't like to be called. Okay, and then the last thing I'd like to add is an, a trim tabbing tip. Now, for those of you who do not know what trim tabbing is or a trim tab, uh, it's something I mentioned in my webinar uh, last month. A trim tab, if you want to, to uh, change or move the ship of state, um, you don't go at it from the side. You don't even go at it from the rudder. You go to the trim tab, and the trim tab is this little flat thing that um, maneuvers the rudder, that maneuvers the ship. Um, so if you want to shift public policy on anything, um, meeting with representatives, you're trim tabbing. Um, uh, Signing petitions, delivering petition is, is trim tabbing, but so are letters to the editor, so are op-eds, and definitely editorials. And what you want to do is, if you get an editorial published or an op-ed, you want to send it to your elected officials. Um, certainly your own, but definitely the ministers, or in our case, the Minister of Education, even the Premier, why not? Um, so just a, just a friendly reminder to do that. Great. So if you have any questions, um, you know, follow questions or what have you, uh, certainly please uh, feel free to contact me. So thank you everyone for being with us. We'll uh, give you another moment or two. And certainly, as Cheryl said, be in touch with us. Um, C. McNamara at Kairos Canada is Cheryl's address. And you can find us always on the website. We thank you very much for being with us, oh, just, Cheryl. Uh, and final and thank you uh, for joining us. And uh, if you have any questions, please uh, see me as a resource. Uh, feel free to contact me. Please note as well, you're starting a relationship. Sometimes it takes a while. Don't give up. Um, certainly with uh, reconciliation, this is a long road ahead. Um, you know, you might not be able to get a meeting on education for reconciliation, but as long as you start the relationship, you might get a meeting on something else in the future. So. So keep at it and, uh, and good luck.